I'm especially excited to start with sitting down with three amazing people who know the potential for women organizing for change. They probably know it better than anyone. Lima Boe won a Nobel Prize for leading a women's peace movement that helped end the Civil War in Liberia. Nicholas Kristof is a prize-winning journalist at the New York Times, and together with his wife, Cheryl Wudung, he wrote a book that they co-authored together about how we need to lift up the other half of the world because it's our best chance to get ourselves out of global poverty. And also joining us on stage will be Laura Weldon, the director of the Policy Research Institute at Purdue University. Her research has charted the impact of women's movements all over the world, and I think what she has to say you'll find fascinating. So please help me in welcoming to them to the stage. So welcome to all three of you for joining me on stage. I think you know our topic is women's movement and their powerful impact that they can create around the world. Now, this is a huge topic, and we only have been given about 18 minutes to discuss it. So I think we'll jump right in, if that's OK with everybody here. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Laurel. You've written a book um, about women's movements. Can you define for us as an audience what is a women's movement? And can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned about how women's movements promote equality? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me here today. It's a great honor to be here with this august company. Uh, a women's movement is a women's movement is a, a way that people organize their um, activities uh, voluntarily together in service of some goal, uh, in service of some idea. Um, so we know that there are movements for environmental justice, for racial justice, for gender justice and equality. And when, when the majority of the participants in these movements are women, we think of them as women's movements. We call them women's movements. One of the reasons women's movements are so important, and I suspect one of the reasons we're talking about them today, is that there's really no other mechanism that's as effective for articulating the particular uh, perspectives and concerns of women than women organizing in their own behalf, than when women are articulating um, their own ideas through their own um, uh, protests, through their own uh, movies, through their own books that they write, when women articulate their own perspectives and are having a conversation about the problems they confront, that's what puts those issues on our public agenda. And there's just no other way that is as effective. They would not be discussed if it wasn't for these movements demanding attention. Hmm. So, Lima, you've led one of these women's movements. And I think, you know, when you first wrote about this for the rest of the world in 2003, you said that what you started with was just your conviction and 10 US dollars, I think, in your pocket. What do you think made your movement so effective in the end? Well, it's interesting, and thank you for having me that you asked that question. A week ago, we had a reunion of the women that I work with. And one of the things they asked was, why do you think we were successful? And the first thing was that we're naive. Yeah. <laughs> None of us had been on an airplane to come to the US. None of us had heard about any foundation that was giving money except for the local organization, let alone did we have any idea of the Nobel Peace Prize. The movement was about what was happening in Liberia. It was not just a thing about bringing peace. It was about the livelihood. If I have to take it any further, I would say what we started was setting up an insurance company to ensure that our babies at five and three, I had four very young children, mm -hmm. lived to be 19, 20, and 21. It was about ending the rape because a vast majority of the women who work with me either lost children or had been raped or had gone through some kind of trauma. So it was about sustaining our livelihood. We women in these communities are the nurturers of society. And it was upon us to change it. When you look at the statistics, and we were looking at the statistics, the war started with one warring fashion. By 2003, we had gone through over 14 warring fashions mm -hmm. and made it more than 13 um, peace agreements. We asked ourselves, these men have done it, the same thing over and over, insanity. We have to come and bring some sense and sensibility to the process. So instead of starting a women warring fashion, let's start a women peace movement. Mm -hmm. And conviction, 
$10, but really just being sure that whatever we were doing had nothing to do with outside. It had a lot to do with the future of Liberia. A friend of mine calls that standing in your own authority, which sounds like exactly what you did. Um, Laurel, you've studied the data about this and the evidence. Tell us what that suggests about these anecdotes and, and how that works and why it works. Yes, uh, I mean, so exactly what Lima described is exactly the thing that we see over and over again, which is that people driven by their convictions um, have a lot of legitimacy. People can tell when you're coming from an authentic place. And when you are coming from that authentic place, people will pay attention and it has a lot of moral power. So we have to remember that. But another thing that we see is that um, you know, women have a lot of power when they stand together in this way. So whether you're talking about changes, I mean, if you think about 20, 30, 40 years ago, nobody was talking about violence against women. Even 20 years ago, people said, oh, it's not really a human right. It's not really, it, it, this is kind of a different issue. It's not really an important issue. Today, you would find nearly every government in the world committed to saying that they, saying that they would fight violence against women, but that's, some, that's progress. Um, we have you know, major human rights organizations have programs on violence against women and on women's rights. Again, that wasn't true uh, 30 years ago. So this is just a couple of examples, but we know from the research that women's movements drive progress, whether it's violence against women, whether it's getting quotas passed in government, whether it's changing laws that govern the workplace, um, or many other areas, family law. Women's movements play a critical role in driving progress in each of these areas. Mm. So Nick, you've traveled all over the world, you and Cheryl, I mean many times, but also particularly when you were thinking about your book, Half the Sky. And I know you're one of the biggest champions to, in commit, and so committed as a male to these women's movements. Tell us what you think the potential is to get more men on board and behind these women's movements. Well, people always think it a little weird that a man is writing often about these gender issues, but um, you know, I think that one of the historic challenges for these issues is that they have tended to be marginalized as soft and as these women's issues on the fringe of, of the public agenda. And the brutal, completely unfair truth is that if only women are addressing these issues, then they will continue to be marginalized. Yeah. And you know, at the end of the day, these are human rights issues that affect men as well as women. And in the same way that um, you know, civil rights weren't just a black issue, uh, LGBT rights weren't just a, a gay issue, uh, that when you have so many women and girls around the world suffering these kinds of inequities, that's not just a women's issue, it's a human rights issue that, that, that truly affects us all. Yeah, and so do you think, are you optimistic that we can get more men behind these issues? I am, just because of self-interest. I mean, I think that the argument that has resonated hasn't so much been the injustice issue. I mean, that, you know, here and there that does. But the one that um, has, I think, worked most is, is the self-interest. You know, you don't need to convince a bird to fly with two wings because it's pretty obvious that it's going to fly better. In the same way, a country and a family <laughs> are going to fly much better if they use both wings. And um, the reason, I mean, Laurel talked about the growing... Uh, interest and investment in this space, that's not because people have become more aware of the injustice, or maybe partly, but it's mostly because everybody has figured out that this is where you get more bang for the buck. Mm. And that is a really powerful uh, argument. And, you know, I, I'm struck reporting in Afghanistan that even in Taliban controlled areas, more and more uh, very conservative families are willing to have their daughters go to, uh, to schools, maybe BRAC, control, BRAC finance schools, for example. And that's partly because the bride price for a daughter in, the, in southern Afghanistan depends in part on how much education mm -hmm. she gets. And there is a value, pe there, people understand that there is a value to an educated girl. And so I think those dynamics are incredibly powerful. And even in the absence of leadership on these issues uh, at the political level from our country and, and some others, I think that these dynamics of self-interest will continue to drive progress. I, I want to jump in, and I, Nick is right, but I also, I also think that one of the ways to get men involved is repackaging. Mm -hmm. If we continue to see women's issue as just a women's issue, a feminist issue, I'll give you an example. In the communities when we work, 
working with some pastors, they said, well, it's all women, 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 women. It's okay. Let's, what does your wife do on a daily basis? And this one pastor said, nothing. Sits home, eat my money, and gossip. So I said, okay. <laughs> Get up on the board. How much do you make as a salary? He put his salary there. What does your wife do first thing in the morning? Oh, she gets up and makes hot water. If you were paying someone to do hot water, how much would you pay them? So it's trying to put a dollar value to every piece of work that the wife did. And we came down to at night when he came from work and down, down, down to the nitty bitty of in the bedroom, if you were paying someone to give you pleasure at night, how much would you pay? <laughs> so all of that, and then we say calculate. And he calculated and times it by 30 or 31 days. And by the time he looked at the figure, the wife made more than him. Mm. <laughs> For him, he had never sat down to think about adding monetary value mm. to the work that she did. And the one thing he said was, no one has ever told me this. And so I think if we begin to repackage these things and take it back into the communities as community work with men, you will get them to begin to rethink that rape issue is about your daughter, that gender violence is about having an unhealthy wife and it eats into your pocket. Mm. Yeah, and I think as we start to look at women all over the world, we're learning also that the amount of unpaid labor they do every day, four and a half hours compared to man every single day, keeps her out of the workforce. But conversely, once we get her into the workforce and she starts earning a little bit of money, the whole way her husband views her, her mother-in-law changes. And that is part of a women's movement, these small grassroots women trying to get women more savings and working. Lima, you've, you've talked about grassroots issues for a very long time, and you've really advocated strongly on the world stage to get more funding for this. Uh, and I know that's been a tough issue. We talked about that a bit backstage. But I also heard that when you first met Justin Trudeau, you made him cry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What did you say to him? Well, um, the prime minister wanted to know what $10 could do for peace. And when we did our activism, it was time for taking the guns away from the boys. And so we were working with the generals, working with the UN, working with everyone. I sent some of the women into the cantonment sites to work with the boys. There's this one Muslim woman who had lost her daughter in the war, and she was part of our m movement. So she was feeding this fighter who had multiple gunshot wounds. And he looked up and recognized her and said, sit me up. And she sat him up, and she asked, he asked her, where's your daughter? She said, oh, she died. He said, I know. So how did you know? He said, because I killed her. Mm. So when she came back to the office crying, we asked her, did you stop feeding him? She said, no. Isn't that what peace is? Mm. To continue to do the work because I know, I knew at that moment I would come back to my sisters and we could cry together. But Melinda, beyond that question of, of, of making the prime minister cry and beyond the whole issue of, I, I get exhausted mm. going from place to place trying to make a point that grassroots women's work is worthy of funding. I'll pick on your husband a bit. <laughs> because if I didn't do that, I'm not here. Mm. When you talk about computers and <laughs> everything about technology, if he went on the global stage today and made a prediction, everyone would pay attention to him. Mm. And if he said, I need X amount of dollar to do this, to avert this, people would give it. Mm. He, that's his expertise. He lived, breathed, everything technology. I'm an expert in my community. Mm. I don't need people to give money to someone to come and tell me how to spend it. Mm. And this is what you see. With a lot of the women's work. But beyond that, you also see it with the way it's projected in the media, in literatures, and all of these things. So one of my passion now is taking our message to universities. So we started this program at Columbia that we're launching in October, where grassroots women will come into this space 
and be the ones helping professor to inform some of the courses around women, peace, and security. But it's, it's, it's high time we reimagine grassroots women work, we reimagine peace and security, but it's also time, Melinda, to, 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 and you all are smart investors, you and your husband. There are women's organizations in Africa, like the African Women's Development Fund, if you gave them money, they will make sure that money get to the people. I would not have been on this stage. I would not have been presenting that paper to President Taylor in the video had it not been for AJ, AWDF taking the risks with these Liberian women who no one had heard about. And there are many lemas out there waiting to be Nobel laureates, waiting to meet Melinda and Bill Gates. <laughs> And I think you'll hear from us about that later today. <laughs> so thank you for that, Lima. Nick, you and Cheryl talk about in your book uh, lifting up other women. Tell us if women were really part of decision making. What do you think the world would look like? How would things change? So my sense is that we tend to exaggerate the impact of women as heads of state and heads of government. That that tends to be what we think is the crucial metric. And in fact, my sense is that, that you know, that's useful, but that, that matters less than having women leaders at the grassroots, uh, having women as village chief. There's a very good study in India about the impact of having women as village chiefs, uh, having uh, women, a critical mass of women you know, on school boards, in, in parliament, uh, in companies. And I think the other aspect of this is, you know, as Lama suggests, this is, really is a security issue, and we spend vastly on trying to enhance global security in countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, et cetera. And we don't think of these gender issues as a security issue, but if you try to think how you can make Afghanistan or Yemen more, less likely to, to fall into civil war, then part of that is empowering women and also addressing fertility to avoid a youth bulge in the population 15 years down the road. Yeah. All right, I could speak about this topic all day, as you all know, I could use it the whole day, but just a quick lightning round before we close. Um, one of the questions that I have for you is, do you think the future can be female, and do you think we can have an equitable world by 2030? Laurel? Yes, I think the future can be female for sure. Uh, women have a lot of power, and when women stand together, there's very little um, that people can do to stand in their way. Um, and I think that with increasing, um, uh, with increasing attention to these, uh, the potential that women have, we'll, we'll definitely see the future be female. Nick? By 2030, there will be more equity, but there are still huge, huge hurdles to address. And one looks at inequities in this country. And so I, uh, I think the future will be fairer, uh, but I think, uh, I don't think it, we will have achieved equity by 2030. Mm -hmm. Lima? I think the future is definitely female. Women all over the world, from the US to other parts of the world are doing their bit. It's time for the rest of the world to walk the talk, mm -hmm. and then we'll have a better world. Well said. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Lima, Nick, and Laurel for this really important conversation. I so appreciate you being on stage today. Thank you for your voices in this.